Well, do you wrestle with anxiety, depression, or thoughts of self-harm? Esther Paul Darty shares how we can find peace even in the darkest times, how to move from the basement of depression to the rooftop of victory. If you're enjoying Table Talk, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Remember to click that notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest posts. You know, people in the church can often be hesitant to talk about depression and suicide, but today's guest is here to share how God is moving in the mental health community and how the mind of Christ really is totally available to every believer. But before we get to that, joining me around the table is April Simons. These are kind of tough subjects, mm -hmm. but important, right? They are so important because yeah. people, it's real life. And yeah. people, everybody goes through certain things and we need to address it and let people know that there's help. And yeah, they can for get sure. It. Haviland, don't you think that the body of Christ and the church should be the safest place to be able to yeah. talk about this and get help? Absolutely. And you know, the Bible talks about how God's made a way of escape and the body of Christ is that safe place to show us how to get out of any trauma that we could ever face yeah. on this side of eternity. That's right. And Rachel, I think it's important to understand that you know, some of the things we're talking about, depression, it could be something physical, it could be something mental, it could be something chemical. I mean, it's important to kind of search that out before we just yeah. say, okay, pray everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad that we have a pastor here that's talking about it because there has been such a literal pandemic mm -hmm. of pastors that have been taking their lives because they haven't felt safe to go and talk to anyone about the yeah. things they're struggling with. And Are so to, feel, have, yeah. to have a pastor be so vulnerable to share his experience and be raw and transparent yeah. so that other people can find freedom is everything. Yeah, and stress and anxiety is a real thing today, isn't it, Rebecca Lamwise? You know the thought that's been hitting me and it hit me this morning What's that? is that we just have to because if we're living in the times that we're living in that are, are difficult we mm -hmm. have to really empower the body of Christ to be victorious in difficult times mm -hmm. so true so true it's Cindy true. Murdoch you and I have known people that have suffered and it's, it's really something we need to talk about and the Bible talks a lot about this mm -hmm. we do and I, I was just thinking a little bit about my past that the the times of hopelessness there was no reasoning in it that I had two beautiful little boys. Mm -hmm. My hopelessness in the life I was in, those moments that I didn't want to live. Mm -hmm. yeah. And needing somebody, a group of people around me to say, Cindy, you know, life is worth living. Yeah, yeah. And, and knowing you, it's, it's unfathomable for me to believe that you ever had a feeling like mm -hmm. that because yeah. you're so the opposite, but that can happen to anybody. Oh goodness, and there are people yeah. watching today that you've struggled as well. We want to talk to you, encourage you today. It's okay. We're going to talk about it. We're going to be vulnerable. Well, he is the senior pastor of Victory Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the author of Mind Games, Winning the Battle for Your Mental and Emotional Health. Please welcome Paul Darty as he comes out to the table. Hello. Hey. That was a fast walkout. Good for well, you. Well, I thought about doing a dance move, but I, could, I couldn't think of one in time. Well, it's so good to have you. Well, you know, it's hard to deny that we're living in an age of fear. Today, more than 40 million Americans are dealing with some form of anxiety disorder, and the numbers are growing. So how should the church be addressing the issue? Paul Darty joins us to share more about his personal journey with anxiety, depression, and trauma and how he ultimately found hope. Well, I think we all can agree, everyone at the table, we want to say a big thank you yes. for sharing your yes. story and your heart and being vulnerable yeah. and transparent. Mm -hmm. You know, when you shine the light on this, mm -hmm. it really can't hold you captive any longer, yes. can it? Yeah, it can't. And that was the, you know, I was so bound by the feelings of like, I could never talk about this. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is a dark chapter mm -hmm. in my life I'll never open up about. And then it was like, the moment that I opened up about it in our church, so many people that I had no clue were battling the same things came up to me and they were like, Paul, we've all been battling depression and, you know, at times even suicidal thoughts and anxiety and PTSD and trauma and all of it. And I was like, wow, we need to talk about this more. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's kind of what's happened through this book is so many more people are 
talking about it. I know, and you know, we grew up in those churches, you know, that knew the Word of God, yeah. and you speak the Word of God, and yeah. you have faith, and you... Yes. And I mean, <laughs> there are people that are watching that they have just been told, well, you need to have more of Jesus. You said this in your book. Yeah. You need yeah. to pray more. <laughs> yes. You need to read the Word. Yes. And there's nothing wrong. Like, you know, I think we teach maybe what we know, and then you start to realize there's more. There's more to, like, God's given us so many more tools to fight against depression, and prayer is one of those tools, and it's great. And the Word of God is totally. an incredible tool. Totally. But then there's also counseling, yeah. and then there's rest, and there's diet, and there's mm -hmm. so many other yeah, things connected to yeah. it that helps you overcome these feelings of depression. And you don't have to just faith it till you make it. You can also apply all these other tools. Yeah. Well, your life is going along pretty good. You are the youngest. I'm the youngest of four. You're the baby. <laughs> baby. <laughs> Rebecca. Yes. <laughs> Rebecca and April are both babies. They're very spoiled. They're Otherwise, they're not yeah. favorite. <laughs> but, um, you know, life was going along. You're PK, but your dad and mom are great people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, the body of Christ yeah. would say, I mean, we've ministered yeah. there, and I've done stuff with your mom and dad personally and spoke, and just wonderful, wonderful people. Mm. Uh, you could have probably never imagined a few years ago what would happen. Yeah. Tell everybody, was that kind of like your first real trauma? Yes, it was. I think, you know, I was getting married, and uh, two weeks before the wedding, find out my dad has lymphoma cancer. Mm -hmm. Find out, actually, that he had been battling it secretly for a year before he told our family. So that was another trauma. It was like, wait, what? Uh, yeah. And he preached every Sunday, every Wednesday, plowed through while he was privately battling cancer, and then by the time we found out, six weeks later, he was gone. Mm. And was, the he, last, was he able to do your wedding? He, yeah, it was the last thing he I did remember, was our wedding. I think I remember He got that. up there, and he was, his voice was very frail, and his body was, he was going through chemo, but he was like, I'm not missing this. I want to be there. Aww. Why do you so, think he decided to keep it a secret? Yeah, I think it's because stuff like this. Mm -hmm. People in that, like mm -hmm. growing up in a word of faith circle, it was like, we don't talk about mm -hmm. weakness, pain, mm -hmm. problems, it's a pretty day outside, there's a tornado outside, no, it's a great day to be alive, you know, it's the day the Lord has made, I'm like, yes. there's a tornado out there, yeah. and they just, he didn't want to talk about it, out of feelings that like our family would add fear to the mix, or we would be worried, or we would start treating him like he's weak, and he's like, no, I'm going to preach, I'm going to see the healing of God, and it wasn't until we were sitting in the hospital, and he apologized to all of us. He, he starts crying. He's like, I should have told you sooner. Mm -hmm. I should have taken a break. I should have rested. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was painful. When he, when he passed that night, I remember standing in the hospital room, and I felt the Lord say, serve your mom, serve the church, and get ready because you're going to pastor this. And I was like, I'm the youngest. I'm the least likely. I'm unqualified. Lord, I'll serve, but I'm not but, yeah, I was like, I, But I told my wife, she was like, don't tell anyone because that's not going to happen. Like, you, So I didn't. I You'd kept like it to Joseph, myself. Huh? Yes, I'd be sold as a slave to Egypt. And so, uh, so I didn't. I didn't share it. And then about a year and a half later, my mom called me and was like, hey, your dad saw you one day stepping into this, wow. and I need you to start getting ready, and I need you to start really helping me with the church. She was the interim pastor for those four and a half years. And we went through a hard season. There was like part of the depression I talk about in the book was having to lay off people that raised me, that worked at the church. Oh. And then walking through it like a, a real bleeding season, thousands of people left because they didn't agree with my mom as the pastor. They didn't, oh. then, then it was like they missed my dad. And so my mom was carrying the weight of loss and pain and rejection. Yeah. And I'm like, she's a Deborah, she's strong. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. God, I got your back, but it was hard. And then one night, yeah, I find myself one night really just contemplating if life was worth living. And it was that night that something happened to me that I share in the book about really waking up to fight against depression. Well, tell about that night, if you will. Yeah. You, you and your Rachel will love this story. Your wife sent you to the grocery store yes. for milk, and you got an argument over... She told me to go to Whole Foods to get organic milk, which is the most expensive place to get milk. And I'm like, I'm, I was raised on Walmart skim milk, and it's a dollar, and we're going to, and I'm going to Walmart. She was like, just buy the milk I'm asking you to buy. I was like, no. You know, we're laying people off. It wasn't about the milk, but I got upset. I got really upset. It was stupid. And I stormed out of the house and went walking that night and didn't stop for a couple miles until I got to a bridge.
Mm. And, and the bridge was overlooking a highway underneath it and there was semi trucks. And mm. I started thinking like if I jumped, this could, this could end the misery and this mm-hmm. could finish off the pain and maybe everyone's better off without me. Like maybe I'm, maybe I'm gonna fail my dad's legacy and it's not worth sticking around. That was the voice The, the, the lies of the enemy. Yeah. Just like you're not qualified, you can't raise funds like your dad right. did. You don't preach like him. You don't preach like him. You suck right now as a husband. I'm sorry. Like <laughs> just so many things that I was just like. So what happened when you had, when you heard those? Because yeah. people are watching right now. You've heard those very sound, those very same voices mm-hmm. that have said, you've made so many mistakes. You yeah, have messed true. up. There is no way God can use you. He couldn't love you for what you've done. And let me just tell you something. They're all lies yeah. okay yeah they're lies from the enemy god does love you what yeah. what happened was there something that happened as you were listening to his voices yeah i felt like my dad was with the great cloud of witnesses up in heaven and i felt like he was up there with john osteen and mm-hmm. lester sumrall and oral roberts mm-hmm. and i could almost now just marcus hear lamb saying, is up marcus there lamb yeah. <laughs> and just saying like don't give up paul like mm-hmm. life is worth living don't mm-hmm. quit and The Bible says, train a child up in the way you should go. He'll not depart from it. I remembered a scripture they used to teach me to speak all the time. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that night, you know, I just pointed in the darkness. I was like, Satan, I rebuke you. I choose to live and I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And I'm getting out of this basement of depression that I've been stunk in. Did you holler it? I did. I probably looked like a schizophrenic on the bridge, just (laughs) shouting in the darkness to nobody. But I was there and I was... I never went back to that bridge. Wow. But that night began a fight for, for victory. And I tell a story where I had a key my dad had given me a year before he passed, and I didn't wow. know I had a key that unlocked every door to victory. A year before he passed, because think about, he would have known about what he yeah. was going through when he gave you that key, but you didn't know. Yeah, wow. he didn't tell me it was the master key. Wow. Mm. He just oh, said, wow. this key unlocks my office. And I was locked out of doors all the time. For three years in a row, I was like, constantly locked out of every door. And then one (laughs) night after that same bridge moment, a few weeks later, I was trying to break into our church because I couldn't get in. (laughs) And a janitor was not around. And um, I pulled out that little key he gave me and I stuck it in there and it unlocked the door. And I was like, what? I've never tried this before. And then I tried it on every door that night and realized I've been sitting on the master key for the last three years and didn't know I had it. And I cried and preached to an empty room that night. Wait, was, wait, you got to talk about You started going into offices. Yes. It would open, but then you get to the auditorium, the 5,000 seat auditorium. He built this auditorium the year before he passed because we were mobile. We rented out the Oral Roberts University <laughs> Maybe Center for 20 plus years as a church. And he built a school that had a building. He built a camp, a college, a dream center. But the actual church, he didn't build an auditorium until the year before he passed. Wow. And he builds this massive auditorium in a city like Tulsa, we're not Houston, we're not Dallas, like we're Tulsa. And I was mad. I was like, we're never gonna fill this room up and it's always gonna be empty. And after he passed, there was more empty chairs Mm -hmm. and more feelings of inadequacy and sadness. But that night I I said, if this key works on this door, everything changes. And I'm gonna Mm -hmm. stop approaching my life in this church with regret and shame and inadequacy Mm -hmm. and insecurity and anger and I unlocked the door and I sat on the stage and I could almost see my dad laughing like, you you now finally figured it out, son. Good job, son. Yeah, yeah. like, duh. Yeah. Took you three years to figure it out. Story of my life. It takes me a long time to get it. But once I got it, I was like, all right, from here on, I am going to start preaching like I have the master That's key. Awesome. Yes. Wow. And I started preaching that night. I put the key in my Bible. I was like, you have the master key. You have the master key. Yeah, and I was like, everyone who asks Jesus, Christ in me is the master key that breaks free of the lies of the enemy. So yes. I started like owning it. And my mom was like, it's time for you to step in. I'll give you the keys. I was like, I got the key. Ooh. And so then, you know, <laughs> that, awesome. that was 10 years ago. And 10 years later, five kids, the church is doing well. The school is doing well. The college, the camp, the dream wow. center. Oh, so the book man. is kind of a story oh, about like, you're gonna get through this. Yeah. Just hold on mm. through the hard times. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Well, yes. while stay longer. with us because um, we're gonna be back with Paul Darty in just a few moments right after this. Imagine facing a storm so vast, it threatens to engulf everything you've built. Would you falter or would you find strength you never knew you had? When a hurricane is tearing through your life, Jesus is the peace 
that steals the waters of your soul. This is a tale of navigating life's fiercest tempests and discovering that sometimes the most profound truths are born in the heart of the storm. Get your copy now at daystar.com slash shop. Well, we're back with Paul Darney discussing his book, Mind Games, Winning the Battle for Your Mental and Emotional Health. One of the stories you tell in the book that I love, you tell so many things in there, but you talk about ministering in Brazil. Yes. I love this because I, I just love to see how God will put you in a situation and you're just thinking, there's no way. I mean, when I started in television, <laughs> that's kind of how I was. I was just like, there's no way I can do this. God, how? In, I think you have the wrong person. Did you mess up? But tell about what happened in Brazil. Yeah. Well, a year after my dad passed, I didn't want to pray for anybody. I was like, <laughs> if you if you need a prayer for your friend, family member, I was like, I'm the wrong guy because my prayers didn't work on my dad. Oh. And so I felt like I honestly stopped believing for a little bit. I was preaching but I wasn't believing in the healing message. Mm. And I knew that was wrong, but I just didn't want to fake it. And so I didn't, I didn't pray for healing. And I was in Brazil. We did an outdoor crusade with the power team. And they, <laughs> oh, did, they did all their stunts. And then they were like, it's your turn to preach. So I do the altar call. People get saved. It's outdoor in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And, and that's it. I'm like, okay, people got saved. Praise God. And the interpreter looks at me. He's like, are you gonna do a healing call, right? I was like, no, you can do that. He was like, no, you should do that. I was like, no, I'm good. I was like, let's let the power team do it. And so he's like, well, I'll go talk to them. So the power team starts doing their stunts. He walks backstage and he goes, they want you to do this. I was like, I can't. And he was like, why? I said, because my dad passed and I prayed for his healing and it didn't happen. And to be honest, I just really struggle with this healing message. Oh, it did. Although it did really happen because, you know, he got his perfect healing. He did. And that was the night that I, I got healed of my own spiritual hurt that I was mm. holding against God mm. and against myself. So this interpreter sits with me and he starts opening up. He says, I watched your dad's funeral on YouTube. I was like, really? He said, yeah, I saw what you said. And he said, what you don't know is that last week, my wife died of lymphoma cancer oh, wow. at age 34. I was like, wow. why are you with us this week? Why are you interpreting for us? You should be grieving. You should be depressed. You should be at home eating ice cream. Like, why are you out here <laughs> preaching in the streets? And he said, my wife in her last breaths before she lost her voice, grabbed my hand wow. and said, honey, promise me mm. something. And he was like, what, anything? And she goes, no, I need you to promise me that you'll do it before I ask you what to do. And he was mm. like, okay, what, I promise. She said, promise me you never stop believing God's the healer yes. even after I die. And he goes, stop, you're gonna live. And she goes, no. She said, I'm not, but God is still the healer. Mm. She said, I'm, mm. I'm gonna pass into eternity, but don't let my death kill your theology. Wow. He's mm. still the healer. Mm. And wow. he looked at me and he said, wow. Paul, just because it didn't happen for you doesn't mean Jesus is not still the healer. Mm -hmm. And I, that night I was like, I've allowed my experiences to shape my theology mm -hmm. and I need to get my theology back yes. to the word of God because he did get healed mm -hmm. and his final healing was in heaven. Yeah. And he said, let's go out there to, as two broken men and let's pray for people. Mm -hmm. And so we both go out there crying. I was like, well, now I can't say no. <laughs> right. So he's speaking in Portuguese. I'm speaking in English. I was like, if you need healing tonight, it was the worst healing call ever. I was like, I don't know if it's going to happen, but just come down here. You know, I was like, we'll see what happens. And he was like, stop it. And so they start coming down and people start getting healed. Mm. And as they're getting healed, I'm backing up and I'm kind of like wrestling because I'm like, I'm glad it happened for them, but why didn't it happen for my dad? Mm -hmm. And I could hear the Lord saying like, let go. Mm -hmm. Faith it's begins good. where understanding ends. And sure. So much of my faith had been built on life going the way I thought and yes. planned. Yes. And God was like, let go of what you don't understand mm. and grab hold of faith. Yeah. And I start praying for people. And then God was like, pray for people with cancer. So I was like, if you have cancer, and the interpreter looks at me, he's like, seriously? I was like, let's pray for him. We start praying for people with cancer. Lumps start dissolving. Wow. Wow. And I just walked away from that night. I was like, God's the healer. Wow. Yes. Can we talk about this a little bit more though? That tension between like faith and reality. Like yes. faith denying what you actually see right in front of you. And if you can't get there, like are you less of a Christian? And like if you do have that faith and then it doesn't happen, like mm. that wrestling with the Lord of like, why didn't you actually do 
what I thought. You were you and, did I not have enough faith? Because like, you and I, you know, we're just in a situation where we're praying and believing for someone that we love, mm -hmm. and we're seeing others, especially younger believers, you know, praying and believing, speaking the word, you know, and yet the perfect healing was graduation to heaven. Mm -hmm. But you know that's, you wonder what effect it's going to have, right? Yeah, um, I mean, it's just like that tension of like, am I not having enough faith? You know, you see what's 100%. right in front of you, and it's like that, that tension of wrestling with that with the Lord. Oh, it's a strong tension, and it's real. And I gave our church permission to wrestle, because I shared that story, and I was like, if you're in a season of wrestling with this, you're not unsaved, and mm -hmm. you're not That's unworthy, good. and your faith is not broken, and it wasn't your fault. Like, and you we, don't have a lack of faith. You don't have a lack of faith. Yeah. Life is so unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus said in this world, we'll have trouble. And it's appointed to un, unto every person to die. We never know when it's going to happen. We're going to all die. How it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. We're not in control. So we pray for healing, but we're in the obedience department, not the results right. department. What do you think about Hebrews 11? That whole chapter where the first part, miracles, miracles, miracles. The same in this hall of faith, those who were cut in half, yeah. those that died, mm -hmm. believing even though they did not receive the promise, yes. they still believed they're so all in that heroes of faith. They died in faith. Yes. They died in <laughs> faith believing. The first part, lots of miracles. The last ones, not they well, didn't. and you think about, like I was thinking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. They said, throw us into the furnace. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, yeah. we still won't bow That's down right. to your idol. And that was a night where I was like, even if he doesn't, I refuse to live a believer's life that limits the gospel mm -hmm. yeah. in my life or in anybody's life because of my experiences. So even if he does or does not heal, He's still the healer. Well, I want you to speak to that person that, I mean, I strongly feel there are people watching that you've been disappointed and you've really blamed God mm. for something that did or didn't happen. It's and it's like your, um, your perception is your reality, although mm -hmm. your perception is not truth. Yeah. And so um, talk to them, if you will. Just look in the camera and minister yes. to them as you feel led, Paul. Totally. Well, first off, I love you. God loves you. And he's not finished with you. And I've been there before where I was upset at God. I was upset at the doctors. I was upset at myself. And I think we all go through those feelings of anger, disappointment, frustration. I remember one time when I was a kid and I went to my dad's office and there was all these guys in business coats who said, go away, your dad's busy. And he came and found me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, I always have time for my kids. Come Aww. in my office. And I just want to say this, God has time for you. Mm -hmm. He's not too busy. He's not intimidated by your questions, your anger, your hurt. Bring it all to him. God wants honest, raw, sincere prayers more than he wants pretend prayers. So bring it to him and he can heal. He's close to the brokenhearted. He loves you. And we're praying for you today just for God to bring healing to your heart. That's good. April, you've had answers prayers. Mm -hmm. You've seen the miracle of your mother healed from cancer. Mm -hmm. Then you've also had un unanswered prayers yeah. in your life. Yeah. My dad passed away, you know, and so I get it. People ask me, you know, what would you have done if your mom died? And, you know, I, I just say, I, I would have known this, that she died believing and stated in faith. I appreciate you sharing the story because I had no idea you're such a great preacher and such a great family, but it just shows that Satan is just He's after our future. He didn't yes. want him to get up on the platform. Exactly. He didn't want him to do what you're called to and do. And he had to kind of establish his own identity exactly. in Christ and walk that out. And As that's a process, isn't it, De Havilland? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, God can't heal what we won't reveal. Mm. Yes. So I love that you went on that journey. Yeah. What would you just say for people that are right now dealing with mental health and they're having a hard time maybe talking to their church or their congregation? How do pastors tackle that? Yeah, I just say open up to somebody. Open up to someone you yeah. trust and bring it, bring it out in the open because that's where the that's healing good. can happen. Don't be isolated. Becca, I know that you interviewed Paul earlier on your podcast and you said one of the things that touched you is that you kind of had that camaraderie in that you both could relate to, to losing a great uh, man of God would happen to be your father. Faith is being okay with not knowing why, because we're not always gonna understand why, but it's believing that God is who he says he is and he'll do what he yeah. says. 
he will do and he holds your life in his hands and that there is kind of like Cindy was talking about that even when things seem hopeless in the natural there's still hope yeah for the future mm -hmm. because our hope is in him mm -hmm. and that hope is the anchor for our soul and you know the other story because you're talking about Shadrach Meshach and Abednego the other story that came to me was John the Baptist because he was like this mm -hmm. another powerful man of God and he like prophesied <laughs> prepared the way for Messiah like was afraid of nothing yeah fearless. <laughs> he locusts in the wilderness baptized Messiah you know said he must increase I must decrease so he can increase but then you know Herod they take him captive and John is wondering where Jesus is and John mm. is like what is going he, on God John yeah. sends his disciples to Jesus and basically says are you the one yeah who you said you were I mean this man of faith has this moment of doubt I'm so glad the Bible records it yes. and Jesus says tell him that the blind see and this and that and he's mm -hmm. basically saying I am the Messiah and he says but tell John not to be offended for my sake mm. and so John had that moment of you know, he pictured his life being one way and it wasn't the yeah. way that he anticipated and he ended up being martyred for his faith, but knowing that God is in control. And so even when life isn't what we expect it to be, mm -hmm. knowing that God is good yeah. and that he has a plan. Well, I'm sure John would have thought, you know, 10,000 angels would have come <laughs> yeah, and broke exactly. him out of prison or whatever. Right. Yeah, and But that's not what happened. No. They would end up, he would be a martyr. He was and, beheaded. And he was beheaded mm -hmm. and... I mean, before really before you would think his time would be. He yeah. was like in the greatest part in of his, his prime. ministry. Yeah, in his prime. his prime. You know, that's all the time we have for today. But I want you to remember that if you're struggling today with depression, anxiety, or even suicidal thoughts, you are not alone. God is still for you. He's not against you. And listen, all you have to do is invite him into your heart and just say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me, come into my heart, come into my life today. I'm gonna to try what those people are talking about and I promise you that he will meet you right where you are and guess what? The best part is that the Bible says he will give you a peace that passes all understanding. I've interviewed thousands of people over the last 30 years and so many times people will be in the middle of chaos and the, the most difficult trials of life, and they will all say the same, th same thing. Those that have a personal relationship with God, they'll say, you know what? Even in the middle of that, I had the peace of God. Mm -hmm. And yes. that's what he wants you to have right now because so many of you need peace and you don't have it. Yeah. I'm asking you right now to give God a moment and invite him into your heart today. I promise you, he'll meet you right where you are. Well, if you're watching today and you're experiencing any of the things that we're talking about, um, again, that toll-free number's on the screen. If you prayed that prayer, invited Jesus into your heart today, I would love to send you a free book. It's the Gospel of John. And uh, that's just our way of helping you get started on this new journey. It's, I think it's the greatest book in the Bible to start with. It really helps you understand the gospel and what Jesus did for us. And uh, so we'll send that to you free. You don't have to give us any information about yourself. We're not gonna ask you for anything. We just want to be a blessing to you. I do wanna thank Paul Darty for joining us at the table. Be sure to pick up a copy of his new book, Mind Games, Winning the Battle for Your Mental and Emotional Health. For more, you can visit him online at victory.com if you're in the Tulsa area you should check out the church. Uh, as always, be sure to follow us on all social media platforms. You can leave us a comment. Let us know how Table Talk is touching your life. We love hearing from you. And you want to make sure that you subscribe to the Joni Table Talk podcast. It's available right now across all the top podcast apps. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, ladies. Hey, those of you that prayed, call us. Let us know. I want to send you that book of John. We love you. Hey, the best is yet to come. Just Lift up your eyes and say, Jesus, help me. I promise you, he'll be there for you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for today.